Hello, welcome to the Friday, September 21st, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. One tool that I don't see used as much as it probably should be used is OSEC. OSEC is an open source log monitoring system, first of all, but it can do a lot more than just collect logs and parse them. For example, it can also check file integrity. And as pointed out in Xavier's diary today, it can also monitor the output of scripts that you are running. And with that, you can, for example, keep an easy look on the output of for example, PS, the script that will tell you all the processes running currently on a Unix system in order to identify known malicious software. Pretty neat little trick. So if you are running OSEC, uh, take a look at this. If not, uh, well, maybe your monitoring system has a similar solution where you can monitor what processes are running on your systems. And usually I don't talk much about politics or legal issues and the like, but NS Labs did sue a number of antivirus vendors, anti-malware vendors, because of a new testing standard that these vendors agreed on. Now, NS Labs is a fairly reputable testing company that tests various security software hardware packages. And well, it has run into vendors in the past, of course, whenever it came out with less than favorable reviews. In this particular case, the problem is that these vendors agreed to only allow their software to be tested using a very specific testing procedure. And while there may be nothing fundamentally wrong with this testing procedure, whenever you define a very specific testing procedure like this, then of course software starts to get optimized for the test and not necessarily for real world applications. Applications. To make things worse, the EULA that came with these products then outright forbade to actually run any other tests against the software package. And that's, of course, where NS Labs disagreed, saying that, hey, in order to actually come up with meaningful tests, we have to come up with new and different tests all the time, just like malware changes all the time. And we can restrict ourselves to this very specific test that you wrote the software against. So it'll be interesting to see what's coming out of this. This has been a larger issue where software vendors did try to limit what tests you can run on their software. And while the news around Bitcoin has been somewhat dying down with the decline of the value of that currency, there has been a new critical vulnerability in the Bitcoin Core software that's in a large part responsible for maintaining the Bitcoin blockchain. Turns out that due to this vulnerability, it would be possible for an attacker to create a poisonous block that if it propagates through the Bitcoin network would essentially bring this Bitcoin network to a halt. Now, it wouldn't be easy to insert a block like this. You would first have to sign it. According to the author who found the vulnerability, it would take about $80,000 worth in computing power to essentially seize Bitcoin. Well, since it's Friday and we have a little bit extra time today, I want to give a little bit more in depth on a topic that I have covered briefly in the past. And I saw a number of questions about this recently via Twitter and uh, some submissions uh, via email and such as well. And what is really all about is new web authentication standards. We all know passwords don't work and ultimately it looks like we need some type of hardware authentication token really sort of as a new replacement for passwords. The problem so far has been that there are too many standards. There is the RSA token that's of the classic and proven way for two-factor authentication, but well, it's pretty expensive. And of course, you have to roll it out across your organization. There are some open source efforts uh, that have uh, created quite a good following, like for 
example, Google Authenticator. But even with Google Authenticator, nothing really sort of wrong with that principle. And yes, you can do it all without Google. It just sort of got popularized as Google Authenticator, but it's not really phishing resistant because there's nothing really from preventing you to insert that authenticator number into a phishing site. And if the attacker is fast enough, they can use it against the real site. And really what we ultimately need is some kind of standard because there are really only so many tokens that you can carry around with you. And even with software tokens in Google Authenticator, I have about now a dozen or so different entries. Well, uh, it sometimes gets hard to find the entry that I'm looking for. Certainly, if I would do it for every single website and would have like 100 plus entries in Google Authenticator, it wouldn't really work. To solve this problem, some internet power players started the FIDO Alliance in 2012. FIDO stands for Fast ID Online and well, it was supposed and is supposed to design standards that then everybody can comply to. The one standard they have finished so far that probably made the biggest impact up to date is U2F, that's universal two factor. And uh, this is a pretty neat standard allowing you to use a single cheap hardware token to securely authenticate to different websites. The most popular implementation of U2F is probably YubiKey, which in some versions can support UTF, but it being an open standard, there are of course a number of different vendors offering authenticators that support it. Google recently sort of came up with one and Google and Yubico were actually the company sort of behind the standard that originally pushed it. The basic principle behind U2F is actually not all that complex. U2F keys use one hard-coded secret. This secret is the only thing permanently stored in the token and the user doesn't have to know what the secret is. Whenever you register your token on a website, the token will create a public private key pair and then encrypt the private key using this hard coded secret in the token and pass the encrypted key and the public key back to the website. So when you're coming back now to that website, you're using your username and password. The website recognizes that you signed up using a U2F token and then it will send you back that public key and the encrypted private key, which you can decrypt in your token because the token knows the secret. And with that, you are then able to complete the authentication. So U2F is meant for two factor. It's not meant to be the only authentication because you first need username and password to actually retrieve this key pair from the website. Another neat thing about this is that you have a different key pair for every website you register for. So different websites don't know that you're necessarily the same person. And the, your key, your little token doesn't have to store all those keys. All those keys are stored with these websites that, well, have a much easier time storing those tokens than you in this little bit of hardware that you don't want to pay a lot of money for. Typically, uh, these tokens retail for anywhere between sort of $15 for just the basic U2F tokens to $50 or $60 for some of the tokens that have more functionality than just U2F. So the next iteration of this standard that Fido is about to finalize now is actually trying to be the only authenticator that you're going to use. So no more username and password. This became known either as Fido2 or also as WebAuthN. Now, like I said, the standard hasn't been quite finalized yet, but it's in a state now where Firefox and Chrome implemented it. And also some hardcore cryptographers looked at the standard and realized that there are some mistakes that were made in defining the standard that probably should be fixed. 
One of these reports came from Paragon and it made the news the last couple days and what they essentially found was first of all WebAuth and heavily relies on RSA. Now RSA is still okay but there are some weaknesses in RSA and what Paragon is saying rightfully so that if you're defining a new standard today you probably should no longer rely on RSA but instead use some elliptic curve cryptography. Another issue that Paragon pointed out was the use of ECDAA. Now, uh, this is elliptic curve direct anonymous attestation. And this really tries to solve sort of one of those fundamental problems where you're trying to balance privacy and authentication requirements. Now, the problem here is actually how elliptic curves were implemented in the standard by FIDO. There were uh, some, as Paragon points it out, fairly fundamental mistakes or oversights that were made here. Also, the way all of the messaging was implemented, again with RSA, does open the standard up to some padding oracle attacks. They say it can be avoided, uh, but you have to be really, really careful how the software is implemented. So better not to require it this way in the standard. Overall, Paragon states that these flaws are not fatal. They are for the most part easily fixed. As far as ECDAA goes, Paragon actually recommends to shelf this idea for now and wait for that particular standard to really mature before it is then being added because otherwise you may end up with some sort of legacy implementations of this standard that will not be then compliant with anything going on further down the road. Well, uh, overall, what should you do? I believe that U2F is actually a pretty neat standard in particular for sort of a smaller user group where you can mandate that people use a compliant browser. Google Chrome is pretty much the browser to use with U2F these days. Other browsers have plugins available if you want to go that route. So not really all that difficult to implement. And yes, you will need to roll out these tokens, which again are not that crazy expensive. So this may certainly be a good idea to experiment with in a smaller user group like some admins. As far as WebAuthN goes, well, the standard isn't finalized yet. So really don't want to recommend to actually implement it yet. But again, given that it is a standard and all the big players like also Microsoft and Apple did voice some support for it in the future. So can't hurt probably to experiment with it and see how it works. So by the time it's finalized, you will have a head start actually implementing it on your site. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.